Good morning. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I'm excited to be here this morning with you, brothers and sisters, and I feel like the Lord's shown me a passage of Scripture that's going to be very encouraging for all of us. Uh, the Lord's shown me a lot in this passage, and I'm excited to share it with you. I titled today's message, Stuck in a Cave. And uh, even though you're a Christian, even though you've given your life to Jesus, even though he has saved your soul and made you whole, sometimes the Christian life, you can just feel like you're stuck in a cave. And nothing's going right. And everything is painful and everything is hurting. Uh, So the question I have for us today is, what do you do when God's way of doing things, the way he runs the world, a.k.a. his providence, goes against how you think things should go? What do you do... When God's way of doing things goes against the way you would do things, when times are tough, how do you respond? So today's passage is from 1 Samuel chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there and bookmark it. We'll be there in a couple minutes. But I had to ask myself, what do I do when God's way of doing things goes contrary to my way of doing things? Or even further, what do you do when you don't act like a godly Christian, when you don't act the way you're supposed to act, you don't act the way you know you're supposed to act, what do you do when you're discouraged, what do you do when you're alone, what do you do when you feel fearful, or what do you do when you're guilty, what do you do when you feel hopeless, what do you do when your life, if truths were known, you'd say, I feel like I'm living in a cave. When the circumstances are overwhelming, what do you do? And that's today's passage we're going to look at. We're going to look at King David before he was officially coronated king. And we're going to see how he responded in one of the worst times of his life. Well, we're starting in in chapter 21 of 1 Samuel. uh, But before we get there, we need a little uh, background. And I just took the liberty to uh, summarize the previous five chapters, starting in verse 16. David shows up on the scene in 1 Samuel 16 uh, as a young boy. And we'll just pick it up there and I'll just make uh, a little overview of what's happening in the five chapters preceding leading up to 1 Samuel chapter 21. So David, as the youngest of eight boys, when he was between the ages of 10 and 13 years old, picture a middle school student, the prophet Samuel comes to his town and anoints him with oil in front of his family and the townspeople of Bethlehem, signifying that the Lord had chosen him to be the next king. The Holy Spirit came upon David, and he was forever changed. God saved David in that instant. The Holy Spirit came into David as a young boy, approximately 13 years old, somewhere in there, and he's changed. Well, a couple of years pass, and somewhere around 18 years old, let's just say the summer between junior and senior year of high school, he experiences the incredible rush of instant fame when he single-handedly killed the giant Philistine of Gath by the name of Goliath. He becomes a national hero. His popularity is off the charts. Got more likes than anyone on Twitter. It's, his popularity is off the charts as a teenage boy. Well, this event gave him the opportunity to marry a princess. He marries King Saul. The king at that time is Saul. He marries King Saul's daughter, Michael. And David went from tending his family's sheep in the wilderness to living in the palace and eating daily at the king's table. Life is pretty good. Well, because of the Lord, David quickly rose up the ranks in the royal army, becoming the equivalent of a five-star general. Every time he took his troops out to battle, he defeats the Philistines at every turn. He's undefeated in military accomplishments. And things got so good for David that a song was written about his military exploits. The song was super popular and rose up the charts to number one for 52 straight weeks on Billboard's Top 100. Everybody's singing this song. People were even dancing and singing the song in the streets. Well, because of all the adulation he was receiving from the public, he had repeated assassination attempts on his life. Get this, from his father-in-law, the king, King Saul. It seems that jealousy had driven Saul mad as we read that he repeatedly tried to spear David to death in the palace. David's life, however, is supernaturally spared, and with the help of his wife and godly friends such as Jonathan and 
that same prophet Samuel who anointed him years earlier, he has a heart-wrenching farewell with Jonathan and makes his escape. But now he's on the run from King Saul who is not only out to kill him, has put a hit out on David. Life's getting really hard for David. David's about 21 years old or so when this takes place. And now that we have the context of what's going on, we uh, enter into 1 Samuel chapter 21. We see David on the run at age 21. And let's just pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his holy word. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to believe that we're actually talking to you right now and just not going through a perfunctory religious exercise of saying our prayers. Help us to actually realize that we're entering the most holy place in the universe right now. And we're asking for help. We're asking for grace to understand your word. We're asking for grace even more so to put it into practice. So Lord, I pray uh, for my brothers and sisters in this room that would say, man, if truth were known, I feel like I'm living in a cave right now. Circumstances aren't doing good. And if there's a video recorder of how I acted this past week and they had to show that on the big screens, I wouldn't come. So, Lord, I pray for the brother and sister. I pray, Lord, that today uh, you would reveal yourself to them and today would be a sweet day. So thank you so much just for the privilege of having your word. Thank you so much for the privilege of having a relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that even in the next half hour or so, we get to know you better through your word, which is living and active. In Jesus, I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Hey, well, 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you have the Pew Bible, it's on page 244. Uh, My Bible, it's page 270. 1 Samuel chapter 21, we pick it up in verse 1. Then David came to Nob. Nob is a town about two miles away from Jerusalem, so he, he, escapes, he escapes King Saul and comes to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. Uh, I'm going to just stop right there. David's 21 at this point. He's a college student. And where's the first place he goes? He goes to see a godly man. And one of the strengths of our church is the college-age ministry. We have college-age students that actually seek the Lord. Uh, I was a college student. I didn't seek the Lord. We have college students here that seek the Lord. And here's David, a man after God's own heart. And the first place he goes when he's on the run is to Ahimelech, the priest. And if you're a godly young man or a godly young woman here today, go to God's people for help. And David does. So then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling. He's like, man, something's not right here. Something's not right. You're on your own, coming to see me. And he said to him, why are you alone? And no one with you. And David said to Ahimelech the priest, oh, 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 why? Oh, that's easy. The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter which I send you and which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. David lies. David lies to the man of God. He says, oh, man, I'm a top secret assignment from King Saul. Can't really tell you what's up, but let's just suffice it to say I'm here secretly. So he lies. Now verse 3. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, truly women have kept, I'm sorry, truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. Line number two. The vessels of the young men who are with me, there are no young men with him, are holy. Even when it's an ordinary journey, how much more today will their vessels be holy? (sighs) So David's sinking a little bit deeper. He's not trusting the Lord. He's kind of doing things on his own volition, and he's lying. And uh, he kind of, when I looked at this, I'm like, what's going on with the holy bread? And I thought there was something there for us. So uh, two things I want to point out about the holy bread. Uh, In these times, in the tabernacle, there be placed two stacks of loaves, six loaves and six loaves, and placed in the tabernacle on the Sabbath. And then they'd be replaced after a week or they'd be eaten. And what's going on there is God provided for the priests that worked in the temple in their holy place so they wouldn't be ceremonially ceremonially defiled when they went out and had to eat. They could eat there in the safety of the tabernacle. 
And then we see that David eats it, and David's not a priest, and he eats it anyways. And you remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 when the disciples were plucking grain heads, going through the fields, and, they go, and the, uh, what were the Pharisees, they jam on the disciples, like, hey, Jesus, they're not supposed to do that, it's Sabbath. Remember what Jesus said? Sabbath's for the man. Man's not for the Sabbath. And uh, the principle I think he was saying there was human need is greater than religious observance. Human need trumps religious observance. So the priest gives David uh, the bread. It says in verse 6, so the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. So we know what the bread is, but I think there was something more personal there. Maybe there's a little something more personable for you. What it shows me is God's providing food for David. Even though he's not acting righteously, he's lying to Ahimelech, and I think God's whispering, David, David, I'm still here. I'm taking care of you, even though you're acting against my wishes. You're not acting properly. You're not acting as a man of God, but I'm still here. And I thought about it. On my worst days, God still provides for me. And maybe today you're here and you're like, yeah, Wayne, I can relate. I feel like I'm living in that cave. And God's saying, I'm still providing for you. I guarantee you, you had breakfast this morning. He provides. Our God provides. And the Lord's with you. And he would say through his word, I got you. I got you. I know you don't like the circumstances. I know things are a little bit rocky right now, but I got you. Well, the next verse I wish wasn't in the text. This is probably, uh, I remember before I was a Christian, I read this story, and I didn't really know what was going on because I wasn't saved. But I remember reading this, and I remember a chill going up my spine when I read this verse, and it still does today, years later. Verse 7, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite. I've never met a Doeg, praise God. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. So first thing I want you to notice here, he's one of the most wicked, evil men in all the Bible. He's a religious man, which makes it a little bit worse. He's not an Israelite. You notice he's an Edomite. He seems like the kind of man I've met before. He's going to do whatever it takes to get ahead in the world. So he's like, hey, man, I'm a little ceremonial unclean. I'll hang with uh, Samuel for a day, and uh, I'll, I'll clean it up. I'll do whatever it takes to get ahead in life. And he's one of King Saul's evil henchmen. And uh, like I said, I feel darkness when I read this verse and uh, when I hear about his name. And there are people like that out in the world. If you want to read the rest of what Doeg did, you can read that later this afternoon. But for our time, we're going to keep moving on. Verse 8. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. Uh, Brennan has a little phrase that he likes to say. He says the word, kind of, I'll do something, and kind of messing with them. And I'm like, hey, wasn't I a great guy there? And he's like, kind of. And uh, David's kind of telling the truth here. It's kind of like this half-truth. And uh, if you look at that verse 8 again, it says, the king's business required haste. And it's like, well, yeah, it did require haste. The problem is the king's business was to kill me. And he's not telling Ahimelech that. So he's kind of shading the truth again. And, and the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck in the vale of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. So he takes this big, humongous sword, the sword of Goliath that he had taken off of Goliath years before and chopped Goliath's head off. Now it's sitting here with Samuel, and Samuel's like, here, if you need a weapon, this is what we got. That takes us to verse 10. And David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Ashish, the king of Gath. Now, if you are paying attention in your spirit, you should be like, what? What? Time out, time out. Where did he go? He went to Ashish, the king of Gath. I just heard about Gath a couple minutes ago from you, Wayne. That's right. Isn't Gath where Goliath was from? And aren't you carrying Goliath's sword with you, David? And isn't Gath filled with a ton of widows from all your military exploits? You killed all their men and all these women are, are widows. And you're showing up in Gath to the king for protection? What is David thinking here? I just wrote down he wasn't. 
Maybe he thought, uh, I'll just sneak in. Maybe no, maybe no, maybe no, maybe no one knows who I am. Uh, and now notice, brothers and sisters, he wasn't seeking the Lord again. He was doing what was right in his own eyes. David's so desperate that he goes to the enemy. And worldly wisdom would say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's wrong. The enemy of my enemy is still my enemy. And if you're going to write one thing down today, brothers and sisters, write down this. The world is always a dangerous place for a Christian to find security or support. The world is always a dangerous place for a Christian to find security or support. Oh, you might find temporary refuge or relief for a moment among God's enemies, but it's always temporary. The world is always a dangerous place for a Christian to find security or support. Some of us have the scars to prove it. So now David's alone, and he's behind enemy lines. Things are going from bad to worse from verse 11. And the servants of Asish, the king, said to him, Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this not David, the king of the land? And we're going to just stop right there in the middle of verse 11. Notice what these pagan dudes said. The guards, the henchmen of Asish, the king, these these ungodly people, what do they say? They say, is not David the king of the land? Who was the king of the land? It wasn't David. It was Saul. Saul had the crown. Saul was the king. Saul had the title. But even the pagans knew where God's power and blessing resided. And sometimes we as Christians get hung up on, I need this title or I need to be this guy or I need to do this for the Lord. I tell you, brothers and sisters, you walk with the Lord. I mean, you walk with the Lord. People will know. People will know where God's power resides. You don't need a title. You don't need a title. You need to walk with the Lord. And that's what David was doing here. And people knew who he was. They knew he was legit. And then it kind of takes a funny turn, in my opinion. And the servants of Asia said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Told you it was a popular song. These guys, miles away, know the song too. And I think of one of these guys just saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Man, don't they sing to him in his dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And I could see this guy saying, man, a year ago I was at my cousin Vinny's wedding and they were lying dancing to this song. I know this song. This is him. This is the guy they wrote that song about. Man, it's got a catchy beat. It gets your feet tapping. And I think King Ace was like, enough. You know, in verse 12, David took these words to heart, and he was very much afraid of Asius, the king of Gath. And I think David at this point hits rock bottom. He's like, man, I'm done. I know what they did to Samson when the Philistines caught him. I know what they're going to do to me, and this isn't good. So what does he do? He cries out to the Lord and said, hey, he doesn't. Verse 13, he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the door of the gate and his spittle run down his beard. So just imagine, you are in such a bad place. You just decide, this is my best move. I'm going to act like I'm insane. So he just all of a sudden, in the midst of all these people, ah, 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 ah. he does that. How long does he do that for? I don't know. But he's like, I have to do something radical to get out of this situation, my men. They're going to kill me. So he changes his behavior. Then Asia said to his servants, behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David at this point has a lot of problems. But his main problem is he's not relying on the Lord. He's not seeking the Lord. He's faced insurmountable odds before, brothers and sisters, and the Lord's delivered him from all these troubles. Do you remember with the Philistine? Remember with Goliath what he said? I come in the name of the Lord. Yeah, you got me by 250 pounds, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord. The battle is the Lord's. He will give you into my hands. He was bold. He was fearless. He was trusting to God. <sighs> Not now. I submit to you that this was a real low, low, low point in David's life. And David probably said something like, God, I know you promised me good, 
But truth be known, I'm not seeing that right now. I'm lying to people and I'm lying to others just to stay alive. I'm so ashamed of myself. I'm so ashamed of myself. Well, that takes us to 1 Samuel chapter 22. He escapes the king of Gath. He's on the run again. This time David goes a little bit farther from Jerusalem, about 12 miles. I looked it up on my phone. That's about here to Parkside. So it's about 12 miles away. And he shows up in this rugged, rough terrain, wilderness, and he's all alone. Or is he? He's not. Someone is with him. He's, in a, he's a discouraged, fearful, guilty man at the end of himself. In one word, he's broken. And God's like, you're right where I want you. You're broken before me. Uh, the youth group is going through uh, the series in youth group on Wednesday night. Dan Miller was telling me about it, the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that first thing Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's what David experienced right here. He was broken and he was poor in spirit. He had nothing working. And uh, I'll just share with you, I go to a Bible study on Tuesday night with, I don't know, 60 some odd men. And uh, I was... For the past nine months, we've had a gentleman coming and his marriage was failing, marriage was failing, marriage was failing. Every week, pray for my wife, pray for my wife, pray for my wife. And about three months ago, he said, pray for me and my wife. And the men are like, hmm, something might be happening here. And three weeks ago, God broke him. And he said, I'm the problem. Now, has his wife got issues? Big time. But he came to the end of himself and he was broken and with tears, he said, I'm a failure. I'm the problem. And God bless Mike Cook, but he said, brother, you are in the best place you can be in right now. And he was right. And then a ton of men prayed for him. You see, God can't use a man greatly till he's wounded him deeply. And God was in the process of wounding David deeply. And he's a broken man when he shows up in this cave. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, what we don't know when he came to the cave of Adullam is how long was he in there for? Was he there a day? Was he there a week? Was he there a month? All alone, just him and the Lord. Him and the Lord. No one coming to relieve him. Just him and the Lord. Well, he's in the cave. And actually, we went online. That's the actual cave of Adullam. So he was in what archaeologists say this was the cave so he's in this cave all by himself with the Lord, just him and the Lord. And then the second half of verse 1, and when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Uh, not kind of the family reunion they had in mind, but all the extended family, everybody's there. And uh, I just wrote this down. The family was suffering. David followed the Lord, and now Saul wanted to kill David's family as well as David. And parenthetically, it says when his brothers went down there. So I just thought about that. The brothers must have been pretty impressive young men. Their appearance, they must have been some studly dudes because you remember when Samuel came to anoint? He's like, oh, that's him. Eliab, that's him. That guy must have had it going on. And then all these guys, Samuel, remember what God had to tell Samuel? Whoa, 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 whoa. We don't look at the outward appearance. We're going to look at the heart. So I just thought about that. I thought, man, apparently the Lord had to humble David's brothers too. How good of him he was to do that to him. So the brothers and the family show up and they're all in this cave and it's starting to get crowded. And then verse 2, and then everyone who was in distress, the cave's starting to get more crowded now, and everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over them and there were with him about 400 men. First of all, who are the people that show up with David now? People that are in distress, people that are in debt, and people that are bitter it's not who David would have chosen to have uh, in the cave with him. And uh, I just thought a little bit about that. That's who makes up the church of Jesus Christ. How do you come to the Lord? You're usually, you're, you're in distress or you're in debt or you're bitter. And uh, I just thought about that. It sounds like our church. And then I really thought about it and it sounds like the ABF I go to. That's how everybody kind of shows up. Man, that's how I show up. 
And then when we're transparent, we can ask the Lord to change us. That's why we have these ABF groups, these small groups where we can get to know each other. Well, I think the key to this second verse is everyone who is in distress and everyone who is in debt and everyone who is bitter and soul gathered to him. Here it is. He became commander over them. I just thought about that crew as they show up. He's a godly leader. That's the key, godly leadership. And I've thought about these guys. These guys come in, grumbling, everything's going wrong. They probably grumble about politics. Man, Saul's the worst. I hate Saul. King Saul, pff, he ain't my king. A couple of guys might have shown up with red hats that said, Mega, make Israel great again. These guys were just grumbling and complaining. Maybe some of them were in debt, and they're like, man, unfair wages. I got cheated out of my 401K. The interest rates are killing our economy, you know. And David's the commander. He's like, we're not going to have any of that. We're not talking about that. This is what we're going to talk about. I've been alone in this cave for a few weeks, and I've been with the Lord, and I've been seeking him, and I've been talking to him, and he's been talking to me, and I've been writing stuff down. Hey, boys, I got some stuff to share with you. And it says, and there were with him about 400 men. And a uh, little side note, those 400 malcontents at the end of David's life are called mighty men of God. Aren't you glad that Jesus changes people? He changes us. These guys learned God's ways. And these guys turned out to be mighty men of God. Are you in that process right now? Well, that brings us to Psalm 34. If you want to turn to your Bibles, we also printed it up in the, uh, in the uh, booklet, the handout. But Psalm 34, we see this as the title of Psalm 34 of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Let's see what David learned in that cave and what he taught that band of malcontents and what this... Psalm and what David will teach this band of malcontents that's joined here today. And as their commander, he's humble. And the first thing I see with David, even before we read Psalm 34, he leads with his failure. He's like, hey, put, the, put it in the title. Yeah, I wrote the psalm. This is what I want you guys to remember it has. It's when I changed my behavior before Ahimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. I want to be known as the fool. I wasn't the great Christian on this one. I was the fool. I acted poorly. And you're like, I thought he changed his behavior before Ashish the king, not Ahimelech the, Abimelech the king. And just to clear that up, Abimelech was kind of a title, and Ashish was his name. So it's kind of like when we say Julius Caesar. Julius was his name, and he was a Caesar, or Nero Caesar. It's the title and the name, so don't let that confuse you. David writes, he changed his behavior and he leads with his failure. He's like, I lied. I pretended to be insane. I wound up crying a lot in this cave. You know what my platform is? A lot of times we need a platform. His platform is I'm a failure. And notice he doesn't boast in himself. He doesn't boast in his past. Hey, guys, follow me. I killed Goliath. I can do it again. Or he doesn't say, trust me. My future is secure. I'm going to be king. Samuel told me. He doesn't boast in his past. He doesn't boast in his future. He boasts in the Lord, and he doesn't boast in himself. I acted like a tool, yet the Lord used me. And he pointed them to God. Trust him. Don't trust me. Psalm 34 has been known as a declaration of joy. You saved me again. And I think David would have said, man, you saved me when I acted bravely with Goliath. When I couldn't beat him, I was acting brave, and you came in and you saved me. And you saved me when I was before his king, King Ashish, And you came in when I was acting poorly, and you saved me. You see, I think he would have taught him James 2.13, even though it wouldn't be written for a couple thousand years. Mercy triumphs judgment. And if you're in Christ today, brother or sister, mercy triumphs judgment. Well, let's see what David wrote and what he told these guys in that cave some long time ago. I will bless the Lord at all times, good times or bad, good providence or bad. It's going to be an act of my will to bless the Lord. I'm going to sing to him when Brennan leads us in the song, whether I like the song or not. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. What I love there, it's not just his praises in my heart. It's in my mouth. It's coming out. And Charles Spurgeon said this, he who praises God for mercy never has want of mercy to praise. He who has 
prays for God for mercy never has want of mercy to praise. Isn't that so? When I'm praising the Lord, he reminds me, man, you've been good to me here. You've been good to me here. You've been good to me here. When my focus is on him. So David tells these guys in the came, hey, listen up, fellas. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Verse 2, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Not the trite, cheesy boasting of the televangelist, but coming from a deep within, from my soul, I'm going to praise the Lord, and it's going to boast in the Lord. And then he says, let the, hum- let the humble hear and be glad. It's interesting. Humble people hate to listen to people brag unless you're bragging about the Lord, unless you're boasting about the Lord. He says, let the humble people hear and be glad. Man, when I'm in church and I see other Christians, let me just tell you, me and Carol, sometimes we're in second service, so we sit kind of right where uh, the Wests are sitting, and we'll just be sitting there, and sometimes we'll peek, and we'll see some people. We just came out of ABF, so we know people are hurting, and people have heavy things going on, and we'll peek back, and we'll see them worshiping the Lord and singing to them from their soul. It does something to me when I see other people praising the Lord. When I'm humble, I hear them. And we're glad. And it just encourages me to see others singing to the same God as me. And then verse 3, David says to these 400 bitter people, oh, you can hear the emotion in him. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. He goes from singular to plural. And let us exalt his name together. He's like, we're stuck in this cave. I get that. I know your thing stinks right now. I knew you blew it. I know you're unemployed. I know you're homeless. I know you own a ton of money. Life is hard. So what? Yahweh is Lord. Life is hard. So what? Yahweh is Lord. Change your focus from the kingdom of I to the kingdom of God. Come on, brothers and sisters. Sing with me. That's what he's saying. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And then he's like, let me tell you what he did. I sought the Lord and he answered me. In this cave, I was just sitting here one day crying out to him. I sought him, he answered me, and he delivered me. Man, I was good as dead before the King Saul and the King of Gath. And he saved me from both those experiences. Man, but what does it say? It says he delivered me, here it is, from all my fears. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not resorting to lying. I'm not resorting to that foolish, acting like an insane person. Man, he delivered me from all my fears. I'm not afraid anymore. I have peace. It's priceless. I've been sleeping on a rock. I don't care. I have peace. It's fantastic. I'm not afraid of the future anymore either. I know he's got me. He's taking care of me. All these other situations, he's going to take care of me again, and he'll take care of you guys again. And I imagine someone might have interrupted him, someone in the group of 400 that church service, like, David, David, whoa, 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 whoa. Man, you're glowing. Man, when you tell us about what the Lord's done for you, you're glowing. And he's like, hey, you know, I know what that is. Those who look to him, they're radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. If you throw up, I got one slide. Uh, This is Bielgard Family History 101. Uh, that's my dad, that's my mom, that's me as a little guy, and my sister Wendy and my sister Dawn, and another sister came uh, six years later. So that's my family picture, and the reason I show you that picture is it was maybe 13, 14 years later, my mom uh, passed away of cancer. Uh, she was only 43, I believe. And the reason I share that is I'm like, oh, Lord, what's this verse mean? I didn't have to look up any commentaries. He reminded me of something from 34 years ago. He reminded me, coming back from college as a pagan, uh, I was the pagan, and my mom had just gotten saved. And she sat me down and started talking to me. Brothers and sisters, my mom was glowing. Now, she was a nice person before. She was pleasant. She took good care of us, all that. That's not what I'm talking about. She was glowing. So that's my mom, Nancy Bielgard. She's been in heaven for 34 years. I'm telling you, I've seen it once. And I know exactly what these dudes, when they saw David, when my mom was telling me about Jesus, she was glowing. Man, I want to glow for the Lord. Don't you want to glow for him? Not just argue Bible points or not argue correct doctrine. Those are important. I want to glow for Jesus. And David says, if you look to him, your face is going to be radiant and your face will never be ashamed. (sighs) I've never seen anything like it. And I want to be like it. I want to glow for the Lord. Well, David continues to explain in verse 6, man, this poor man cried 
And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Guys, I came to the end of myself. I, try, I stopped trying to fix my own problems my way. I asked the Lord to help me. Man, I couldn't stop crying. He broke me in this cave. And he, got, he put this song in my heart and I'm just teaching it to you guys. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. He's saying, man, the Lord's been revealing stuff to me. And the main thing he's revealing to me is there's more to this world than what I can see. There's an unseen world too. And all I know is the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear them and fear him and he delivers them. And then he ends with this verse and we'll end with this verse. Oh, there it is again, this emotional groan of David. He's got one passion now. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's a gospel plea. It's good news. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And I think about it one by one. These rough, bitter, discontent, malcontent men tasted and took refuge in the Lord. Don't stay at a distance from the Lord. He desires an intimate relationship with him. Experience him through relationship. How do you do it? Verse 8, he says, taste and see. Now, at that same men's study, someone said when we were studying this passage, he said, man, if you're going to taste food, you have to do something about it. You physically have to make an effort to get the food You have to go to a grocery store, you have to buy the food, you have to prepare the food, and you have to put the food in your mouth and eat it. And what I see there is to taste the Lord. You're going to have to make some effort. It's not happening by osmosis. Make the effort, taste, and you'll see that the Lord is good. So, brothers, sisters, taste them this week. Taste them today. Skip the Packers game. I know you're going to stall me for that. Skip the Packers game and seek the Lord. Taste him and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman that takes refuge in him. You see, on the authority of God's word, Jesus is calling each one of you to himself. When he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle. I'm humble in heart. You will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you cry out October 2nd, 2022 and say, Lord, I need you. I don't want to play church. I don't want to do the right thing. I want to follow you. I want to get to know you better. Brothers, sisters, taste him. Taste and see. He's good. Well, let's pray. (sighs) Lord, I need you. I don't have a problem admitting that because I've spent time alone with you and then I see who I really am, not who my church persona is or not what my title claims I am, but who I really am. Lord, I'm just a little boy who needs you. Oh, how I need you. Every hour I need you. So, Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters today that are in the cave. They feel like they're dry. They feel like they're hurting. They got some sin that they haven't got right with you yet. Lord, I pray that they would come to you today. Lord, they wouldn't be quick to run to their ABF for first in line and snack. Uh, Lord, they would actually spend some time alone with you, even in their seats, and cry out to you and uh, reach out to a leader and just say, we pray for me, I'm hurting. And Lord, I know because I know you and I know you're good. I pray, Lord, that you'll, uh, when someone seeks you, they'll find you. So, Lord, we need you today and just pray, uh, Lord, that that would be our heart's cry today, that we need you. And Jesus, I pray in your name, amen.